So thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our webinar called COVID-19 and Technology, Impacts, Challenges, and Opportunities for the Future. This event, like our previous ones, is proudly supported by the Ukrainian Credit Union, which generally provided financial support to cover the costs of the Zoom license that makes this online event possible. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. If you are experiencing video or audio issues, please exit the session and try to log in again. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be shared on social media. You may ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your window. It allows you to post questions to the panelists and myself anonymously. If this feature doesn't work for you, you may post your question in the chat window, which can be opened by clicking on chat at the bottom of your window. And lastly, you should all be muted, but if not, please mute yourselves. Uh, for those of you joining us who are not aware of our organization, there were a couple names I didn't recognize. Uh, we are the Ottawa Gatineau branch of the Ukrainian National Federation, or UNF, which was founded in Edmonton, Alberta in 1932 and was incorporated by an act of parliament in 1950. The UNF is dedicated to the preservation of Ukrainian Canadian history and the cultural heritage of Ukraine. And we host numerous events like this one throughout the year for our members and the broader community. If you're interested in becoming a member of our organization or would like more information about it, please email us at ottawa at unfcanada.ca. And now moving on to our event. Um, as some of you may have seen, this event is covering COVID and technology, and so I'll read a brief description to sort of set the stage. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about many sudden changes to our lives, with the increase in our use of digital technologies being one of the biggest. This has resulted in a variety of impacts, some positive and some negative, some temporary and some likely permanent that will evolve as we continue to adjust to our new normal. We are lucky to have two technology experts and active members of our community speak to us about this issue tonight. So first up, we have Alex Backus. He is the Director of Sales Operations at Fullscript, as well as an active member of the Ukrainian Canadian community in Ottawa and a former member of our executive board. In 2015, with support from our Ottawa Ukrainian community and his wife, Riza, he organized a successful drive to procure and deliver 750 pairs of military boots to Ukraine's front line. Professionally, Alex is the Director of Sales and Operations for Fullscript and has spent more than 10 years in various leadership roles in companies within the technology sector, most notably seven years at Shopify. He is currently completing his Master's of Management in Artificial Intelligence. Also speaking with us tonight is Simon Sulema, Director of IT Audit at Manulife, as well as the current President and former Vice President of the UNF Ottawa Gatineau branch. Under his leadership this year, UNF Ottawa Gatineau has successfully overcome challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought, namely the inability to host in-person events, which required the branch to adapt to delivering engaging events online. Tonight's event is the sixth webinar that UNF Ottawa Gatineau has hosted online since the beginning of the pandemic. In his professional life, Simon is a seasoned cybersecurity and IT audit professional with over 15 years of experience. Over the course of his career, Simon has been working to protect technologies such as cloud computing, big data, internet of things, and artificial intelligence from different threats. And Simon has a deep technical experience, expertise in various technology domains, including identity and access management, data loss prevention, network and application security, data management, and third-party risk, to name a few. Thank you to both of you for joining us tonight to share your insights and expertise with us. So to get started, and enough talking for me, I'm going to let each of you speak for about two to three minutes. Um, if there's something you want to add about your backgrounds, and to generally comment on the current situation and what you're seeing in the technology domain. Simon, you want to go first? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, and so thanks for watching us today. Uh, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, um, technologies are playing a very critical role, as you know, in keeping our country and other countries functional um, during the time that, you know, we, we have to stay home and, you know, in during the lockdowns and current uh, quarantines. And uh, I think that those technologies which we are uh, development today, they will have a long lasting impact beyond just COVID-19. Um, 
in in my um, 15 years of experience, as Katie mentioned, so I, I can't really name any single technology that didn't exist before COVID-19 pandemic. That means that if anything, this pandemic has accelerated the growth of technological uh, trends and uh, uh, you know those trends that were already happening before. And now we have uh, more money put in into technolo technology. We have m way more pressure um, put on technologies to help us overcome these um, challenges related to COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm I'm very optimistic that you know we will beat this virus. Obviously, uh, it's hard but not impossible. And um, you know you can say that vaccine may be the cure, uh, the ultimate ultimate goal. Uh, but we might have to adjust eventually the same way we adjusted to, to a seasonal flu. Um, and, you know, a very good trend which I'm seeing right now is that um, a lot of countries, in fact, most of them collaborate with each other. And so they work on the common good. Um, so, and technology is actually here to help. Um, and then just, just, um, just want to make a small disclaimer. So whatever I'm going to say today is, is my own opinion and, and not of my employer. Alex? Uh, thank you, Simon. I think it's, um, you're bringing an interesting point and I wanna thank the folks that are attending this webinar. I know, uh, you know, Melania, she's, uh, you know, I think she's heading up the pediatrician uh, wing and it's just, she's a very busy doctor. Um, so I don't wanna thank her for her time and, and uh, you know, Vicky's here, Ruslan's here, I see a Roman um, and a few others. It'd be, it's awesome that, you, that you're joining us. I think, Simon, you're bringing about a really great point that a lot of technologies, most of the technologies that we see so far have existed pre-COVID. Interestingly enough, they existed, but perhaps in a less scaled or less uh, operationalized way. Um, certainly Zoom, uh, the tool that we're using now, I think only had like, one or two million users pre-COVID and then overnight it, it went you know from to 20 million and then over 200 million uh, users right so it exploded uh, in growth and we, we had this concept of the video webinar or video chat but certainly now it's becoming a completely new normal <laughs> and we're not meeting in a uh, you know, Villa Marconi or, or some other uh, sort of community um, house that we're used to meet, to meet. Uh, we're doing this from, you know, my basement office and, <laughs> you know, Katie's apartment and so on and so on. So um, it's an interesting new norm. I think some of the stuff will for sure persist. Um, I think human nature, um, you know, will tend to win um back you know it's it's going to be very difficult for us as humanity to for sure like um give up um being in close quarters with other people and socializing so we will have to sort of learn some new tricks um and you know if we look at what happened with the spanish flu in the ninth you know in the sort of early 20th century we can sort of point out that some of the things from that time period sort of persisted, uh, certainly more so probably in the medical field, we began to realize what hygiene is, is we began to realize the effect of uh, staying outside, washing hands. That was like a step change uh, from, from coming out from that flu. We, we began to, you know, right around that time, we, we discovered penicillin and that really um, sort of accelerated our, our <laughs> survivability as a species. And I think a lot more of that kind of stuff is going to come. Um, that it's going to be very hard to sort of, we're now reading tea leaves uh, as to what the future is going to hold. So we don't know what the new norms are going to be. Um, but some of the, some of the, some of the, the, the more uh, restrictive uh, things, I think will sort of pull back just, just a tiny bit until we hit a new pandemic. <laughs> and we'll bring those right back. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the chat and I think, uh, uh, Katie, you've uh, sort of compiled some questions from the community and some questions for, from, from what, what is on, on top of everybody's mind. And, uh, you know, I think Simon and I will do our very best to inject our thinking and inject our unique perspectives. 
For sure. Thank you for those uh, opening words. Uh, so I guess our first question, and you know, both of you sort of kind of alluded to, to some of this, um, about how uh, a lot of these trends in technology were, all, were already happening, and if anything, they kind of just got accelerated. Um, building off of some of what you said, um, how have you seen our use of technology change since the start of pandemic, apart from, you know, just an increased use of the technology? And um, do you see these changes as being largely positive or negative? And do you think they'll last? Do you think we'll continue doing uh, things the way we're doing them now? Okay, Alex, if you don't mind, maybe I'll take this one, uh, at least to Please. start. Yeah, so, um, so obviously the use of technology and most importantly, the trust that people put in into technology have increased since the beginning of pandemic. Um, just to illustrate how much trust uh, people have in technology, let me give you two, two facts as, as fresh as, as yesterday. Uh, one, um, you might have heard this already, Apple has doubled its valuation from one trillion to two trillion dollars yesterday, and one trillion dollar was back in March this year. So right when the pandemic has started. Um, that's remarkable because if you think about that, Apple hasn't, hasn't really come up with any new products uh, since, since March, right? Um, they haven't produced any new device, any new technology. They only tweaked some of them. That's one. Two, the stock market continues to soar despite the double digit un unemployment rates in, in Canada and the US and, and the rest of the world. Why is that? Is that's because investors are, you know, people have money, investors have money. So they pour in those billions of dollars into the hands of those big tech companies. And because they see them as a, as a safe haven during this pandemic recession. It's no more, um, it's too dangerous to, to keep um, uh, your investment in cash, in government bonds, uh, because as, as we know, you know, the money are being printed and everywhere. So, so the, only, the only way for them, well, they think the only way for them to save some money and maybe even multiply is, is to invest in, in the stock of big tech companies. So that's that's just um, that's just how the world sees the big tech company, and it's not just big tech. As as Alex mentioned, Zoom. Who knew about Zoom? Raise your hand. Who knew about this before March? Um, yeah, it's funny. I can see <laughs> your hands, uh, and uh, you know, not many people did, right? And so, what do we have now? Um, you know, hundreds of uh, millions of users, right? And so, the stock price for Zoom. Uh, soared from 70 bucks per share to, to 270 in six months. Uh, not quite the growth that Apple has demonstrated, but still not bad for a company that, you know, really wasn't known to the public. All the industries that uh, had to undergo a rapid technological transformation to, to adjust to, to the new norm. Retail. Um, I think no one would argue that e-commerce finally won over traditional retail. I mean, we see the we, we have seen those trades over the past couple of decades. Uh, we saw that uh, you know big depart uh, department stores have closed their doors um, in Canada, U.S., and you know the rest of the world. Um, the Amazon uh, they started from selling books, and now they sell everything. You know, literally everything. Um, and you know, um, just uh, just want to give you an example. My wife uh, she always disliked shopping online. She, she was like, well, how, how can you shop online? You can put things on, you can touch them, you know, like it's, it's, it's useless. Now we in 2020, August, and, uh, you know, we, of course we were forced, forced to stay home and the, um, the retail stores were closed. So my wife, you know, out of necessity, you know, tried to, uh, to do that. And, you know, she liked that. And now that we have our stores back, her shopping experience was uh, was terrible for the first time, as she said. And uh, she said, well, there is a very lim uh, limited number of people who can be admitted to the stores. Uh, you have to you have to sanitize your hands every time you, you come to a new store. Sanitizing hands is good. We know about that. But if you do it like 12 times in, in one hour, you know, it, it can kill good bacteria as well in your hands, right? Um, 
you know, you, you can't really, there is not many, much variety in stores because every time someone put puts it on and the, decides not to buy it, you know, they have to quarantine it for at least 24 hours. So, I mean, it, it makes for, a, you know, not very pleasant experience, right? So that's retail. What about insurance? Um, I know I work in the insurance uh, industry. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I had to buy life insurance and, you know, obviously the insurance company would, would, would send a nurse to my home uh, to do the blood works, urine test. If you want to buy insurance now, what are you going to do? Like, is your insurance company going to send you a nurse home? No, very unlikely. So your provincial has healthcare already has a lot of information about you. So why would you know want to use it, right? Um, again, it's another example of uh, digital transformation. Education. Um, we'll see how it's going to look like. Uh, I think Alex, you you might might want to say something about education, uh, but at least fifty percent of the high school curriculum is going to be taught online. Education. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I, I mean healthcare. Um, have you had any virtual appointments before COVID nineteen? I have not, and now it's it's probably the most likely way you can see your your doctor and get your prescription, um, you know, new prescription. I can go on and on, uh, but nothing is new, right? So we are going through a very rapid technological transformation, and you know the the role of the COVID is that it actually really accelerated that. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to add to it. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you covered a lot of the, the good stuff. Um, so I'm going to just, just, just to give a little bit more, um, more color to the e-commerce versus retail comment and healthcare, my current sort of, uh, my experience and my current industry. And so uh, the interesting step change that we, we've seen uh, on the Western uh, en end of the hemisphere, which is um, we went from low sort of teens uh, in terms of e-commerce adoption. So there's like a big pie, right? It's called the retail pie and it's very, very large. So we, we you know, e-commerce represented about 10% of the volume. Uh, you know, 11, 12, that kind of thing. And every year it would kind of grow about two, 3%. Um, certainly the retail pie is growing too, but that that um, that e-commerce bit was still in the early teens. And basically the amount of the expansion of e-commerce as a totality of retail, it experienced 10 years of growth in the span of one year. So it went from low teens to, you know, 30% uh, of all volume occurring via e-commerce. So it's, it's now a, a formidable chunk of all the sort of discretionary and consumer spending that we see um, in the Western world. And, and more importantly, the, the, the really huge industries that, of course, experienced in the e-commerce side is grocery ordering. It went from you know, it went from like a five to to nine percent rate here in North America, to you know over fifty at one point, um, and still that 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 habit tends to show that that habit sticks. At least what we see from from the perspective of what happened in the East in China, um, when you know like up to during their very very restrictive lockdown they had up to 80 percent of the of all the groceries um uh, be online and online del uh, and delivery on that i think they still maintain 60 percent so of all the of all the volume and this is coming from a sort of grocery chains that are owned by alibaba uh, one of the larger companies in in in, in china and sort of uh, asian continent and what we're going to see, you know, the, the, the adoption of these technologies uh, a little slower here in North America, but once, you know, it, it, the, uh, basically the rule of the game is once people transition to this new behavior, it becomes a multi-channel strategy where um, now it's a lot easier and a lot less friction to go online and, and, and start your e-commerce 
And then if you're really missing something, you can do the in-person or the, you know, you, but the amount of friction that you have to do, which is what Simon alluded to, you know, you got to put on the mask, you got to, you got to do all the, all the hand sanitizing, which is all those great things. And we should keep doing when we're, when we're, when we need to go out into the public. Um, but there's just, if you don't need uh, immediacy of the item, uh, if you don't need uh, certain ingredients and certain items right away that moment or that hour, um, you can plan for it now. And the the explosion in just even in the delivery services job, so the companies like Instacart and Uber, um, they're, they're the amount of uh, sort of contractors who do this work has exploded. So that gig economy uh, is still on the rise. In terms of healthcare, um, my current sort of um, <laughs> my current uh, field where where we are, we've seen a huge, tremendous growth. So we're a software that helps folks um, and healthcare providers um, manage um, adherence and prescription of supplements and, and sort of any uh, nutritional based uh, uh, sort of health. Um, uh, nutrition focused health and supplement uh, focused health uh, provision and so we have seen a huge rise in folks that are worried about their the state of their immune system using uh, the supplements industry as a way to uh, beef up their 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 immune response um, just to, to mitigate some of the immunocompromised situations that they're in and just um, we've seen a, a huge rise in virtual care and pretty much every doctor, you know, lots of medical doctors on our platform, um, they transitioned and we provided the tools to help them transition to, to manage the prescriptions. Um, and, and there we see huge rise in engagement in that tool versus in the past, it would have been crazy uh, to have a virtual, like, I mean, the whole medical industry was anti um, uh, anti-virtual practice and it was it was uh, you know everybody had all kinds of privacy concerns turns out all you need is a good catalyst and things can really start moving I mean I'm not gonna remove that there's still a lot of privacy concerns but it turns out the technology companies can actually address that and the good news is we've had legal frameworks such as you know HIPAA in, in the United States that cover provision um, uh, for for the way you know certain medical records need to be treated so the that's the good news we've had the frameworks we've had the regulatory that we've had the technology ready to provide that there wasn't just the consumer adoption and the health uh, providers adoption so the supply wasn't there uh, the demand of course uh, was coming online and now we just have a, a catalyst for the supply to sort of enter the, the market in terms of you know, I think you asked a very interesting question. If I go all the way back to the original prompt, <laughs> being mindful of the time here, six twenty, we're still on question one. Um, so we are. You asked, has it been a positive or negative experience? I think that's that's um, uh, an interesting philosophical uh, approach here because positive or negative is is a sort of a morality and ethics type discussion. I think technology is a tool. Right, so there will always be bad actors and good actors, and folks with good intentions and folks with bad intentions, and it can uh, uh, sort of, depending on how the technology is used, um, it will show um, a positive or a negative uh, side. Um, sometimes those consequences, though, are unintended. So I know a lot of technology companies are building with like good intentions. But we know the saying, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions as well, in that, um, you know, what we kind of see is a lot more engagement, a lot more communication coming online. And this applies to my kids as well. They're always chatting with, uh, with their friends using all kinds of uh, chat applications. And, um, you know, none of it is particularly bad. It's not, it's, it's not a negative thing. What is negative is probably what what that what kind of data they're generating and how that data is going to be used in the future to profile them. So, so certain certain messaging applications are owned by sort of the larger conglomerates such as Facebook, and we all know that they use all kinds of data uh, stuff. And so so it's not um, you know it doesn't impact the experience right now, but we don't know yet what is the unintended consequence into the future. 
Um, so it's, um, it's a sort of a give and take, um, you know, on the one hand, you can't limit the, it's, it's, you know, I would not want to see it say even the word limit because you, um, you know, it highly depends on the network, right? If, if all your kids classmates are using a certain application, the, you're basically forced into using that application. Otherwise you're cutting the, the your, your child off from communication and that could have far greater uh, implications from a mental health perspective than the use of software, which you don't know what's going to be used and the kind of data it will generate and how it's going to get used into the future. So it's always like this, uh, uh, you know, a trade-off and it's this game that you're kind of playing that, all right, I'm going to let my kid have some feeling that they have friends and uh, <laughs> hope for the best into the future of the unknown unknowns. Um, so I'm going to stop there from the, from the, uh, I know that I can see that Villian has asked some questions. Do we want to sort of, uh, address yeah, that? Was, um, yeah. Cool. I, I can read them out and then, uh, each mm -hmm. of you can sort of answer them as you see fit. So the first question, uh, for Q and A, and I encourage everyone to use this by the way. Um, Villian has, has been using it quite a bit, but you are all free to ask questions. So the first question is, what do you see as potential job opportunities arising from the current soaring popularity of technology? Okay, uh, so may maybe I'll, I'll start and uh, there is no like right or wrong answer, obviously, and we can, we can talk for hours about this. But um, what I would say is that technologies, um, Obviously, if, if you just go on LinkedIn or Indeed and you, you search for like the technology related jobs, you, you, you can see what's, uh, what's on demand right now. But um, it, you, you can also see what the trend is, right? So uh, for instance, um, I know Alex is doing a master's degree in artificial intelligence. It is, it is very in a high demand, I would say, right? So otherwise alex wouldn't, wouldn't have been doing this right probably <laughs> uh well uh data science science a scientist right um so i have friends uh, one is a chemist another one is a psychologist so they switch to the uh, data science and they they don't look back like uh, they, they like it and i think the future is uh, is for that now when we talk about all sorts of technological jobs and things that you know didn't even exist like 10 5 10 years ago it's sometimes it's hard to predict uh what the new jobs will be um i have seen statistics somewhere that 20 years from now there is going to be 50% of the jobs which don't exist today so you have to um like you can guess you can make a calculated guess like uh, you know like many people do but um the skills which you need to build right now or improve um are you know soft skills right and those soft skills are highly transferable so you you, you can be doing sales today uh tomorrow you're gonna be doing um i don't know programming right um you know there is there is some fundamentals that you know you uh, required in in both worlds or in each and every profession and i would encourage to focus on those now as we move more and more into artificial intelligence then there is there is a big question about ethics right and and i'll give you an example so for instance self-driving car right so it has a passenger in the back seat and then there is let's say two two kids playing on the street so all of a sudden they they got on the on the road and then the car now needs to decide whether the car is going to hit those kids or the car is going to switch to a reverse lane and basically kill the passenger right it's a decision which you know we somehow need to build into the algorithms now if you ask me you know what's what's worse you know kill the passenger or kill, kill those kids i will say yeah, kill the passenger you know come on and uh, right so i mean most of us will because we have some we have some ethical considerations and we have background and you know it's just the way you know we, we think but if you if you are that passenger, right? Then what decision would you make, right? Not necessarily, you know, to, to save yourself. Now, 
like I said, somehow the, the engineers have to build this into their algorithms, right? So that ethical consideration is, is really important. And I see that there is, a, there is gonna be a big demand on the jobs in the psychological field. People, you know, uh, philosophers, psychologists, you know, uh, you know, professions that have to do with, with these things. And um, yeah, we're gonna see a lot of demand in that. Um, it's just one example. Alex, do you have another one maybe? Um, it's a great, it's called the, what would you describe about the kids and the passengers it's, it's referred to commonly as the trolley cart problem. Uh, and it's a very hotly debated um, uh, situation in the, in, in the AI space. Um, the very good news is that the, the situation is never actually that black and white. Um, and extremely rarely is it ever that black and white. Um, but the really cool sort of expanding to, to add on what, what you said, what is the uh, ethical consideration? It turns out that it depends on which culture you ask. Um, and so there's a massive difference between uh, the decision on who to kill, whether it's a group of people, whether it's, there's, you know, all kinds of surveys that were, that were done in, in different cultures and cultures that, that for example, um, there, there are some uh, examples where cultures that have value uh, the elderly more than they value the youth, they will prefer to keep the elderly alive, but uh, it, you know choose to sacrifice the child versus uh, the passenger. Sometimes it depends on the brand of the car, um, and, and in, a, in a weird, interesting way, I think Mercedes. If you were in a Mercedes the preference is to keep the passenger in the car versus the, um, the, the person outside. Anyway, all these are just one-off anecdotes, but it means that it, the, really, the really important work and the sort of social rules that we're becoming to discover uh, are a huge part of the consideration. And the algorithms that we currently build off of uh, have a lot of cultural bias attached into them. So, you know, um, the, way, the way the typical algorithm will be trained is based on all the past data. And so um, whatever the algorithm, that, you know, if, if we don't intervene in these, in, this, in these decisions, the past data is going to continue self-propagating and sort of multiplying itself. Um, and we saw this in the hiring decisions. And so... Um, uh, we saw this in, the, in, 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 in hiring decisions that Amazon used. So they ran an algorithm to sort of figure out who the successful hires were and then compared them to all the resumes that they were getting. And it turned out that their algorithm was sexist, racist, and, and all kinds of um, biases in them because, again, it reflected the hiring practices that Amazon might have uh, perpetuated from the past. And so they had to kill the algorithm. A similar example was that uh, Microsoft released an algorithm into the wild, um, and it was a Twitter where you could talk to talk to this little bot and it would like learn. And so within 24 hours, it learned how to be a racist and a Nazi because people were just feeding very nasty things at it. And so it's a self-reinforcing learning system. And of course, it only it picks up what, what the environment throws, right? It has n none of that. Um, I think a fantastic example is again, facial recognition where, um, you know, in, in low light versus, uh, versus uh, good light conditions will depend on its ability to, to sort of map a person um, and, and allow a person through, right? So all these systems that, that we're considering now from a COVID perspective uh, in terms of recognizing whether you have a mask on or recognizing your temperature, doing the infrared analysis, um, it will change and react based on um, you know the color of your skin and, and based on how, how dressed you are um, and what, what, where, what the lighting conditions are. And if the algorithms don't sort of uh, adjust for it, uh, it might just not let a person in because it might not recognize the, the, the mask on your face um, for all kinds of weird reasons, specifically if the people are training it on algorithms uh, and on pictures of just uh, folks 
wearing masks that represent only a, a certain subsection uh, of, uh, of a community, which might not be representative of the population uh, audience as a whole. So lots of, um, uh, but it's not answering Villian's question about jobs. <laughs> so I'll sort of double back really quickly here and, and um, come back to this question. I think jobs, I think my, my sort of answer to that is consider the patterns, right? In early 20th century, so early 1900s, the most popular and the most well-paying job was an electrician, right? And actually not just an electrician, but a linesman electrician, right? So this was the turn of uh, the century. We were electrifying uh, all of North America and all of the world. And so pulling wire, installing electricity all across houses was the, the most, it's the, you know, the equivalent of the programmer or engineer today right? Um, the, the highest paid, highest, highest sought after job, right? Electricians as a trade and as a job didn't slow down. It didn't cancel. Uh, but certainly it is not the most sought after job today in the in sort of the beginning of the 21st century. In fact, what we do see is are all these technology jobs. And for the most part, if you think about technology jobs, um, what they what they kind of represent is like, translating human context and translating human requirements uh, or business requirements or the complexities of our life and our uh, uh, environments into machines, right? And what we're doing here is we're teaching people specific syntaxes, we're sp teaching people how to think, uh, it, 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 how to approach this from a scalable perspective, but really you're using a human to translate code uh, and and turn in and sort of model reality in, in, a, in a binary system, right? And this is all fantastic and I think has a huge amount of uh, future for the next 20 years. Uh, after that, I see a lot of the, the, the AI models, uh, you know, there's been a recent one released uh, quite, quite recently. It's called the GPT-3 by the OpenAI um, sort of group. And uh, it, this 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 uh, neural language programming model, um, it, it it can it can write code now on your behalf. You just have to describe what you want to see, and you have to tell it that you need you need it in HTML. And it you know it has learned and consumed enough code base uh, across the internet that it can sort of predict what it is that you want to you want to do. And lots of people have done really cool examples with it where you can even uh, tell it like I want three buttons with uh, th in this color in this shape uh, centered and it will just spit it out for you to translate that into images and translate that into an actual user interface that you can then port over and get your back end engineers to uh, to 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 translate that into uh, into code. Um, and it's a very interesting situation where, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that all the coders are going to get replaced in 20 years. No, all it means is that suddenly now you'll have a lot more people um, with the capability to create, right? And so just like uh, the invention of the Gutenberg press and the, you know, the the rice paper that that the cheap paper that we got for the Gutenberg press allowed for the dissemination of the books. Now all these technologies are going to make it really easy to translate your wishes into machine code. And I think the future is actually back to what Simon said. It's in the creative field. It's in the um, it's in the uh, uh, it's in the ability to work with other people. It's in the ability to translate complex uh, complexity into simple to understand. Uh, uh, processes, and I think that's where the you know from a, from a personal development perspective, this is what I would triangulate. Um, all this technical stuff is like it's cool for Simon and I because we're in it right now. But by the time we retire, I imagine a lot more people are going to do a lot more beautiful things with technology than than we imagine today. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm just going to move back to um, the prepared questions I have since we're uh, talking about artificial intelligence. Um, curious to know um, how how AI has helped address and tackle challenges that have been faced um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in the healthcare industry, and how you see AI influencing healthcare delivery in the future. 
Mm. Alex, over to you. Hey. Like, I, yeah. Um, I alluded to this already. So there's, um, I think, um, you know, uh, I have a, a few of my classmates that are working directly with hospital systems and 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 uh, uh, and hospital networks. Uh, and I think there's there's a, a colleague of mine in uh, from from my master's program that's working with the Ottawa Hospital. Um, in order to, um, there's a couple of things, right? Um, one of them is, uh, of course, the, the the obvious, like detecting whether you have a mask or not, just to let you in, or um, you know, sort of the gate entry uh, technology, the measure your temperature in order for for you to be to to, to enter or leave a building. But a really important stuff is, um, you know, happening behind the scenes on the modeling and operationalizing of care. And what I really mean by that is. Um, a lot of the artificial intelligence stuff, let's throw out the AI portion, but machine learning algorithms are being used in order to model the spread of the virus, in order to operationalize and give uh, ideas on clusters where the, the, the sort of uh, where the pandemic is most likely to spread, who are the most likely super spreaders, um, where are we most likely to deploy uh, medical resources, that kind of information and modeling is coming online very fast and, and um, beginning to give, uh, you know, um, sort of surgical capability to healthcare provi uh, providers to be able to address situations before they get out of hand. And this information is, is based on, you know, the last 20 or 30 years of research. Um, and a lot of it is based on the sort of uh, uh, SIR models uh, that were developed in the early um, AIDS uh, research that we had about how, uh, you know, in reinfection rates happen and how, uh, who are the, uh, you know, which communities are spreaders and, 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 and all of that sort of viral um, uh work that was done um, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. And we're just now operationalizing it to a level that, that you know, individual hospitals can, can, can begin addressing that. The other side of it, and this is probably something that Melania is uh, familiar with, is capacity management right now. I mean, uh, you know, at the beginning, the province sort of canceled all the discretionary um, all our non-essential surgeries, and we, we were sort of hunkered down and waiting for this huge hit um, because we were looking at what, what Italy was experiencing, and, and that's uh, overcapacity and no ability to treat, no protocols to treat. And so AI is being used in sort of helping to manage capacity in hospitals and manage that. Uh, I'm not sure yet. We, we are using it here in, in Ottawa, but I know that in some, in some jurisdictions, they're beginning to model those, uh, those sort of uh, overruns on the system and what that would do, where to send people. You know, are we going to open up school gyms? How are we going to deliver, uh, deliver uh, that capacity? So I think... Lots of that stuff is being co-developed right now based on the virus hitting us. And I think uh, the real sort of opportunity there is not in the way COVID is going to be dealt with. Um, it, you know, I think the real opportunity is that our, our readiness for something similar in the future, um, you know, and our, uh, we will have at least just like the, the sort of AIDS virus prepared us for knowing that viruses, how viruses spread and, and how that sort of model works. Now we're, we're going to begin to sort of have that, uh, have that knowledge operationalized. And I think that's the opportunity for AI uh, post this pandemic. Very interesting. Thank you for those insights. It's now a question that perhaps is uh, more applicable to uh, Simon being in the cybersecurity space for a long time. Um, what are some of the risks that we've seen or maybe are yet to see of this sudden rapid increase in the use of technology and what measures could be taken to prevent these risks? Yeah, I love this question, Katie, thank you. Uh, there are many risks, obviously. Um, first is, um, the first one I, 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 I wanna mention is over-reliance on technology. Um, while we we are forced to work from home, study from home, just stay home, um, we you know we had we, we have to adjust and we have to 
find a way to connect with each other to collaborate and you know exchange the information and what if what if all those technologies we have right now would stop working right there is no continuity plan if you are um, like b- back before before COVID, if you work from home and your internet is down what are you gonna do you're gonna go to probably starbucks or you're gonna go back to your office right and work from there now you you don't really have this ability anymore right so um there is a big reliance on on, on technologies now as someone who like built internet 15 years ago um <laughs> You know, I've I've seen a lot of change um, in in the way like network technologies have have um, grown and improved, and um, right now I can say that uh, you know those technologies are quite reliable, unless you use something which which depends on the weather, such such as you know wireless internet some some somewhere in the countryside, right? That may not be like the very reliable option for you. Now. I don't know if any major technological disruptions ever ever since the pandemic started that would affect a considerable number of workforce or industry, but it doesn't mean that it may not happen, right? Um, uh, this weekend there was a there was a hack on the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, I think the last information I have is like over five thousand uh, accounts have been compromised. The, the reason is very silly. Uh, like people just reuse their own passwords elsewhere and at CRA websites. So guess what? So as soon as the, the fraudsters um, got those passwords, they tried them, you know, in, on other resources, including CRA. And that's the way they, they were able to compromise those accounts. But the consequences are were quite, um, how to say, not unexpected. I mean, you, you can expect this kind of response from the government, but it was, um, you know, <laughs> it was quite unusual in a way that CRA just decided to shut down their their whole online application. Um, uh, guess what? You know, it, you know, it, it made it impossible for people to apply for uh, for money such as CERB um, or for businesses to apply or for businesses to report their um, income tax. So that's just a small, small, a relatively small example, right? A small problem that resulted in a, in a bigger, bigger, you know, issue. Now, the possibility of a massive technological outage, as I said, is still there, and especially with the cyber crime being on the rise, um, and so we've seen um, a lot of uh, activity at the nation state level um, from countries such as China or uh, Russia. And, uh, you know, we have to be, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how like security is important right now at this moment. And so security is everyone's job. And so there are simple yet very effective um, hygiene rules which you can follow, such as, you know, don't click on uh, links, unknown links, use strong passwords, don't reuse the same passwords in your online banking and in, in your Gmail account your CRA, try to use multi-factor authentication. Everyone has a smartphone right now. So use use that authenticator application in, on your smartphone to be able to log into your, you know, critical websites, web applications. Um, mm-hmm. Install the patches. As soon as you receive the notification from your phone or your computer, install those patches. Use antivirus, use personal firewall if it's applicable make regular backup copy of your important information. Some people think, oh, well, it's, I don't run a business, so I don't have any important information. Really? What about your uh, family pictures? Uh, I don't know about you, but I would be very sad if I lost my like 20 years of, of uh, family albums, right? Um, make a backup copy. Another risk of uh, sudden increase in, in the use of technology right now is the risk of mass surveillance. And this is the, there is a lot of speculation uh, around this, and I want to be I want to caution you that you know it's not that black and white. Okay, um, if we're talking about mass risk of mass surveillance, but by totalitarian regimes such as China, Russia, Iran, or others, then yes, it's the 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 threat is really it's is imminent. Now, 
The countries with liberal democracies, such as Canada or United States, are not immune to that either. So, so beware. Now, if if we're talking about the technologies in the hands of benign government, um, the powerful and widespread surveillance that includes contact tracing, uh, face recognition, uh, remote temperature checks, location tracking can be actually quite helpful and it can contain the virus outbreaks. It can prevent them, the new ones from happening. Now, th the same algorithms and system can also lead to a big brother, right? That might end up, we might end up just living under 24 seven, a constant monitoring and not only our external activities, but also our inner um, things such as, you know, our emotions, our thoughts, um that can be uh derived from from the um uh, from things such as you know our heartbeats our breathing our level of hormones and so forth right so having those data points in one hand is quite dangerous right so it's you know it, there is a there is a very um there is that desire you know potential you know inherent risk that someone wants to manipulate with this data and use it in in their own advantage, especially totalitarian regimes, like I said. Um, and so once the, the government has such a power, uh, would you agree with me that it's almost impossible for them to surrender it back when the COVID pandemic ends, right? It sounds like a f science fiction, you know, things that I mentioned about like breathing and heartbeats, but look at China, you know, m you know, over a billion people uh, lives under cameras, on the drones that patrol the streets, uh, they have to, they forced to use QR health codes. So like if you navigate the city, let's say you, you, you get from your home to your work, you have to like take uh, like a subway, you have to walk on the, on the street, right? So there is like checkpoints, you know, those big QR codes that you have to scan with your phone and then you, you either get pass or you, you, you're gonna get denial, right? So it's either green or uh, right, and that uses a lot of um, a lot of data points on you, where you live, who you talked with, who you contacted, you know, over the past 14 days, um, to calculate the risk, so that it can just deny access constantly, right? So the future is now, right? So this those kind of things already happen. Um, yeah, so that's very funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, perhaps maybe we have about four minutes left. Uh, would either of you care to comment? There was that, you know, COVID tracing app that the government recently released. Um, based on what you were just saying, you know, how do you see how do you see that app fitting in with some of these risks, or or is it generally helpful? Either one of you can answer that. But I remind you, now we're at three minutes. Yeah, Alex, maybe you want to take it. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's a really interesting situation, right? So, um, just based on the the background with with what you presented, I fundamentally agree. Once you give government some sort of regulatory allowance, it's really hard for them to pull back. Now, I want to contrast that to the COVID alert app that was released, um, uh, you know, by the government of Canada. But behind the scenes, there was extremely capable engineers uh, working behind it, developing this uh, in a system that sh both shares the, you know, Google's uh, best practices for security and privacy and Apple's best practices for uh, security and privacy. And um, the engineering team behind it specifically worked to address um, this sort of fear of, um, of capturing more data than is necessary, uh, and it specifically limited the capability and the and the um, sort of the negative risks of getting getting some of that information. And so the app itself works in a very disintermediated uh, way, and it allows for separation of knowledge of who you are as an individual where you are located ver from the government itself. And it also protects the system and the network from fake um, sort of um, 
uh, for people saying, yes, I got COVID and now suddenly, you know, all the, all the folks get notified. So that was one of the, one of the biggest concerns about the, this kind of an app application. Um, so it, it allows for, you know, the governmental body has to give you a code, a specific code that you enter in this app. And then once you enter it, um, you don't know who it's going to go out to. The government doesn't know who it's going to go out to because it's all randomized code and they're separated. They're separated from each other. Uh, there's a phenomenal amount of information that explains all of this right from the Canada website, right as you install the application, goes through this fundamental explanation. And it's not at all a measure of controlling it's a way to for you to keep yourself safe. So it has nothing. It almost doesn't mean anything for you to be like, oh, holier than thou, and save other people or help other people. That's actually not the point of this app. It's actually to keep you safe. That's it. So if you care about yourself, you want to install this app, turn on, uh, let it run. It does not eat any battery. Uh, you know, I, I've I've had it on the day that it uh, was installed. I was a big fan of that of this launch, and, and I follow closely. There's been many, many security reviews of this application, uh, all passing green checks. So if you're hesitating based on who somebody's going to find out who I am or, or any of that stuff, it, it, those, those worries are um, sort of addressed uh, and built specifically to, um, uh, to alleviate this pressure. <laughs> I mean, any final remarks? No, I, I completely agree. And uh, after Alex and I talked a few, few days ago, I installed the application, I play with it, and you know, I, I read so I can I can attest to, to what Alex just said. So yeah. <laughs> it has zero Excellent. personal information on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this has certainly been a very enlightening chat. We covered many very interesting topics, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, potential jobs created by this sort of uh, increase in the our use of technology, whether or not it's a positive thing and really uh, dove deep in, into the ethics of AI and, and where it could be used um, and sort of finished off with the risk. So thank you so much to both of you for taking the time to participate and educate us all um, on technology. It's, it's, I've enjoyed planning this event because it, it's an area that's uh, very dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us um, for this event. Thank you. And thank you, thank you so much. and Melania for organizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. Excellent. Everyone. Good night, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>